Hi, ladies and gentlemen, it's Dr. Hula Navoa. I'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, sign on. So, living as the life of an OBGYN, you gotta live off um, off the fly, and sometimes your best uh, laid plans are not what you expect. So I'm not at home. Luckily, I was able to um, uh, do this presentation from the office. Nevertheless, uh, hi everybody. Hopefully I can follow along with all of the questions. Okay, hi everybody. So today's uh, discussion is uh, supposed to be about what actually happens with medical records. And so you might want to take some notes on this one because it's rather surprising for most people. I also welcome or hope that all of the uh, associated um, groups that I'm with, specifically East Shore Problems, the Post-Tubal Ligation Syndrome uh, groups, the MESH groups, and the Breast Augmentation groups will uh, sign on or share this uh, presentation. So let's go back to the to the original comment or the subject matter what happens with medical records first of all get ready to take notes number one medical records are not the property of the patient the medical record is actually the property of the doctor or the doctor's practice so what happens is that you come in you ask for um, medical diagnosis, medical management, and the doctor writes that information in the medical record. What are mandatory, however, is that the medical record be accurate or to as accurate as can be, and that it follows certain state and federal guidelines, specifically HIPAA, which is privacy issues uh, or protection of privacy, and also it must follow state medical board regulations as far as the integrity and the maintenance of privacy and the maintenance of accuracy of the medical records. Outside of that, the medical records do belong to the practice. Now, you can always request a copy of your medical records, but you're only going to get a copy of the medical records, not the original medical records. It's also important to understand that if you find in the copy of the medical records that there is an error that has been made, you have every right to request that the error be corrected. Or you can request in writing that there, if there's not going to be a correction made, that an explanation as to why the correction has not been made. Very important. So if you come into the doctor's office and you explain something and you read the medical records because you asked for a copy and the explanation is not properly documented or not documented at all, then you have a right to request that the medical record be corrected. And if it's not corrected, you have a right to put an objection to that particular documentation in the medical records. And that has to be maintained in the medical records. If for whatever reason those, those rules are not followed, you have every right to file a medical a complaint against the medical licensing board of that particular doctor. And here's where it becomes so important to understand what your rights are. A lot of patients get frustrated because they think that, well, they were, um, they were basically dismissed from the practice and they don't have any rights as to what their medical records are. You do have rights. It's just that it's not something that we commonly talk about because we really, um, as doctors, not necessarily myself, but as doctors, doctors really, uh, like it when they can keep patients in the dark about a majority of things, especially if the doctor has made a mistake. Okay, so this is very important. Now, the integrity and time period that a medical record must be kept is dependent on the state of which you, where you live. Now, it, it also can apply internationally, and I welcome all of my our international followers uh, to, to go ahead and take notes and to share this as well. Uh, so, and this is where it's important, specifically out of the United Kingdom and Australia, where we've been getting a lot of commentary about things that are concerning to me as far as professional integrity is concerned. But I digress, so let's go back to the United States. But it's happening across the entire world, 
it because doctors are basically acting the same way. So what's going on there? The, for example, let's talk about the state of Texas. In the state of Texas, if you see a patient, you're required to document in the medical records uh, in a legible format and a reproducible format the medical uh, um, record of that particular event um, and you keep it in the patient's chart uh, for a minimum a minimum of seven years here in the state of Texas it's seven years so that means that from the time that you write a note to the time that you can dispose of the medical records is going to be seven years from the last note that was written in the chart so if I were to have seen a patient for 10 years and the last time that I, and I, I, I saw the patient 10 years ago, but every year, started to see the patient 10 years ago, but every year I see the patient once a year and I saw the patient last year. So I have uh, 10 notes, okay? I cannot destroy or shouldn't destroy the notes that were written uh, 10 years ago. I should keep them all together as part of a uh, medical record because something from 10 years ago may be uh, important to understand or be aware of for an appointment this year. So it is important that despite the fact that you have a medical record that goes longer than 10 years, you should keep the entire medical record in case there's something that you need to go fall, uh, fall back on or go back and review. So we're talking about the state of Texas, for example. There are many states that the minimum uh, number of years that you have to keep a medical record is going to be seven years. So let's work with the seven year rule. Now, there are no specific number of years that the federal guidelines say that related to privacy, only that privacy must be maintained. So we're not looking at a federal issue, but we're looking at a state issue as far as that is concerned. If you have medical records, the medical chart is, uh, is longer than seven years, there is a good possibility that your doctor will destroy the medical records. This is why it's so important that if you think that there's something important in your medical records, you must demand a copy of the medical records tomorrow, for example, or Monday. As now that you know what is generally happening with medical records, it is your obligation, basically, to go ahead and get a copy of your medical records. So what do you do as far as that's concerned? You send a letter or you send a fax. I prefer to send faxes because you have proof that they received it. You send a fax or you go into the doctor's office and you ask to fill out a medical release form. And here's a little bit of a catch there. Generally speaking, if one practice is going to send the medical records to another practice, then what happens is that it's a courtesy. No matter how big the medical record is, generally speaking, whatever the doctor has from one office is going to send the entire medical record to another office without charging a fee for sending the medical records. However, if you walk into the doctor's office and you request a copy of your medical records, they're generally going to charge you depending on how many pages. Here in the state of Texas, more than 20. After 20 pages, they, have to, they can charge you. We can charge you. And so we charge you by the page. And if there's pictures, we charge you by the pictures. And if it has to be put on a disc, we charge you for the disc. And if there's anything else, depending on the rules of, for example, the Texas Medical Board, we are allowed to charge for a certain number, uh, uh, for a certain amount of money, depending on what you're asking for. But it's exceptionally important to ask for a copy of your medical records because Again, we're not obligated to keep the medical records for longer than seven years here in the state of Texas, and then important to find out exactly what the, the minimum requirement is for the state where you live. So, number one and number two, you have a right to your medical records. They are not your medical records, but you're entitled to have a copy of the medical records. And after seven years, minimum seven years here in Texas, the doctor can destroy your medical records. So this is very, very important for women that have devices such as the Eshore device or the Paragard device or the Felshi clips, Holka clips, or breast implants because on average, you're going to have your medical device in place for more than 10 years. And if you don't have a copy of your medical records, then you're basically out of luck, basically, 
um, because the, you're not going to have any information related to that particular device. Now, there are some devices such as breast implants that have serial numbers on them. There are some devices that, uh, like the Paraguard, uh, uh, that they come with little cards and such. But if you lose your card, except for the breast implants, for example, that have serial numbers, eShore devices do not have serial numbers on them, and so you don't, you can't follow along. You suppose that one day that that um, eShore gets recalled, and because they did find some uh, manufacturer defect with it, that you you don't have any idea what you don't have your card, you don't have your serial number, you don't have anything, and therefore uh, you may not even be notified. Probably would not be notified. So it's very important if you're going to have a long-term device placed that you get a copy of your medical record so that you have your serial number, you have all of the information related to it, and evidence as to exactly what the doctor is saying that they did. This is very important as related to operative reports as well. So now we're talking about what happens inside of the office. There's a, uh, an inherent issue related to documentation in the office because it's so not only ob uh, subjective, but also basically to cover the doctor's butt, okay, basically. Because a doctor can manipulate the medical records, especially if it's handwritten. Luckily, since we've uh, been using extra, um, uh, electronic medical records, it's computerized. And the electronic medical records by federal regulations and also state regulations are no longer able to be manipulated like the paper medical records. Uh, you can't uh, slide in a sheet of paper in there and say that we had a discussion when we didn't have a discussion, per se. Per se. And the electronic medical records, every time that you go into the electronic medical records, there's a documented log there. And if you manipulate the medical record or change the medical record, there's a documented log there. And then you have to explain yourself as to what you did and why you did it. So this is very important, especially for the practices that are still in paper form. And there are still a lot of doctors that still use paper because they're the most vulnerable to manipulation or to change as far as the medical records are concerned. The ones that you want to look at or be aware of are the electronic medical records because number one, they can't be manipulated or altered without someone knowing about it. Number two, in general, especially if the company, if that particular practice works with a company, those medical records may be held on to longer than seven years because it's in a digital format. You have to understand that a lot of practices, they don't do it intentionally like to harm someone, but large practices have thousands of medical records, literally rooms full of medical records. And if you've seen 15,000 patients, 20% of your office could simply be holding on to medical records for a patient that you haven't seen in 10 years. And that's one of the real uh, reasons why we're allowed to destroy medical records after seven years here in Texas. But since we've been going to digital format, an entire Library of Congress can be kept on a single disk and therefore space is not an issue and many practices that are using electronic medical records uh, are keeping them on digital format and therefore they don't have to destroy them, they can keep it for much longer than that. Next, hospital medical records. The hospitals are obligated to hold on to medical records at least four years longer than the office medical records. So here's the distinction. You have medical records done in the office and you have medical records done at the hospital. If any procedure was done in the office, you're not going to have that information in any hospital medical records unless they were copied as part of a history and physical and sent to the hospital and included in your medical records. So there is a possibility that some of your history that may have been destroyed may still be part of a medical record at the hospital. So it's always important to get a copy of your hospital medical records. Many hospitals, however, will destroy medical records after 11 years. Now there are some very large hospitals that keep them on microfilm and therefore you can have medical records that extend past 10, 15 years. But never take the chance. If you can, Get a copy of your office medical records. Get a copy of your hospital medical records. Now, here's another issue. Whatever happens in the hospital does not automatically get duplicated and sent back to the office to include in the office medical records. There are two distinct entities. 
So it's possible that some of your medical records will wind up in the hospital medical records, and it's possible that some of the hospital medical records may wind up in your office medical records. But if you had a procedure done in the hospital, it doesn't mean that it will automatically be included in the office medical records. For example, if you have eShore device placed and you had it placed in the office, unless you had a complication or a reason, that operative report of that information related to eShore may not wind up in a hospital medical records unless you were admitted to the hospital and that, and that's, that would needed to be included. And the opposite is true. If you had the procedure done in the hospital, it's possible that, uh, that none of that information will wind up in your office medical records, even for follow-up. So that's the, very, very important and why you need both medical records, those from the office and those from the hospital. And get yourself a little packet and store it away some, somewhere important where you know that it's not going to get destroyed by, by floods or fire and the such. And believe me, there's been plenty of fire sales. I have seen plenty of offices claim that their medical records were destroyed in a fire or they were destroyed in a flood. Even hearing that from the hospital, oh, we had a flood and our records were destroyed in the flood. Well, I mean, come on. I, I, I find that hard to believe in, in most cases. Now, there, I can't say that it's not, but you have, to, you have to keep that in mind, that it's in your best interest to get a copy of your medical records uh, from both the office and um, from, from the hospital. Next, how long should it take you to get a copy of your medical records? very very important question if you have filled out the proper form and I for example let me give you an example you go to your doctor's office and you say I would like a copy of med my medical records they're obligated to produce a form that you can fill out and include what what information of your medical records you're asking for my recommendation is to go ahead and get all of your medical records including HIV status and everything else get the entire medical records and it's it's a, an investment worth paying for okay because like I said, once those records are destroyed, you're, you're never going to see any information again. So you turn it into the lady, you have her sign it, you sign, get a copy of the date that, you, that both of you signed it. Now that the, now you have proof that the doctor got a request for your medical records and the doctor's in the doctor's office. Now the time clock starts. Okay, depending on the state, they have anywhere between 15 and 30 business days to produce your medical records. Generally speaking, 15 days is the average, so that's very important. If you ask for your medical records, generally speaking, they have 15 days to produce your medical records. If they cannot produce your medical records in 15 days, they have to give you written reason why they can't produce the medical records in 15 days. Maybe it's off-site, and you give them a little bit of, of flexibility. Uh, Texas Medical Board takes this very seriously. For example, if you're a doctor in Texas and you do not produce medical records in the 15-day period of time or there's a there's appears to be a delay in producing medical records, you could be reprimanded or sanctioned by the medical board and it can cost you $20,000 just to defend yourself before the board as to why you didn't produce medical records in a timely manner. That's very important. I'm hoping that the same thing applies to other states, but it's Obviously, you have to check with your medical, state medical board as to what's going on if your medical records are not being produced in the 15 to 30 day window. Now, that doesn't end, you don't come to a dead end if the doctor's not producing the medical records. It's obvious that you say, hey, listen, I got in touch with you guys. I've been waiting 15 days. You haven't produced my medical records. Um, and they said, well, I'm sorry, we, we didn't get the message. So I have proof. I have proof that, that I came in on the date signed. And if you're not aware, state medical board regulations say that you're supposed to produce my medical records within 15 days. Do I need to make a phone call to the Texas Medical Board? Or do I need to make a phone call to my particular board? That's what you have to do. You have to be, I'm sorry to say, you have to be a little pushy, maybe a little bit of a pain in the butt to get your medical records sometimes because doctors really feel like, eh, you know, let's put them on a waiting list. We'll get around to it. No. You have the right to ask for them and get them in a timely manner. Don't think for a second that you can't make a complaint. At any time, you can pick up the telephone. And, and, and here in Texas, for example, you can call up and you can leave a message or you can talk to someone and you say, I didn't get my medical records when I asked them. Here's, the, here's a, a distinction, however. If they have your medical records and they notify you that they have them, you are 
required to pay for them if there is a fee associated with it. And again, the fee has to be associated with within the regulations. But to say, well, they had my medical records, but I didn't have the $30 to pay for the medical records and they should have just given them to me, that's not part of the requirement. So if they tell you that they have your medical records you're, and you have to pay for them, then they can wait as long as they have to or they want to until you pay for your medical records. But if you go in there and say, I have my $30, where's my medical records? Or if they're saying, it's gonna cost $30, please notify us when you're ready. But if they can't produce your medical records, then you have a right to, um, to make a complaint. The next thing is, what happens if something's missing in your medical records? This is another board regulation and a board violation if your medical records are incomplete. Very important. For example, there are some practices that, uh, for, the, for eShore for example, they were done in the office and they had the eShore device placed in the office and now they can't come up with any records related to the placement of the eShore device. There are so many regulations that have been uh, violated in that particular scenario. Number one, before you place the eShore device, you have to get informed consent from the patient. They have to have written informed consent to do a medical procedure. So if they can't produce a medical uh, informed consent, they're already in trouble. Because it's a medical procedure, they're required to write an operative report or a note describing what happened during the procedure. That's number two. Number three, they are supposed to keep a copy of the eShore serial numbers and the little card that they give you. They're supposed to keep a, keep a copy of that in your medical records. So that's number three. Okay. If none of these things are in your medical records, you have a right to complain and there's been a damage done to you and you have a right to sue if you wanted to, depending on uh, whether or not the board's going to get involved. And again, board actions don't cost you anything. They are done on your behalf for the public welfare. And so when you complain to the Texas Medical Board or to, to complain to your, your medical boards in the state where you're in, uh, they are doing the follow-up to that complaint as a public welfare requirement by st uh, state law. And also if you're complaining on a federal level, privacy documents you can't get rid or destroy or not have medical records as a HIPAA issue and there, you, there is a privacy thing as well. So they can get in a lot of trouble either on a state or a federal level. So suppose that they say, well, we weren't, you weren't even one of our patients. Okay. This is why it's so important to keep a receipt on anything that you do, especially if you had um, a procedure done that you paid through insurance. Your insurance uh, will document all of this stuff and will have it on file. And why is it that they do keep this stuff? If you've ever applied for insurance, for um, health insurance, not health insurance, I'm sorry, um, life insurance, they can, the life insurance companies can get your entire history by going back and, and looking through codes uh, from the uh, health insurance companies that paid on your behalf. So you may have forgotten that you, that you had a, um, a diagnosis of, of something rather embarrassing like herpes 10 years ago, um, and there may not be any, any labs to confirm it, but there's a, there's a code there that says herpes, and your life insurance carrier will that know that because of something that was coded. So it doesn't just disappear in a thin air. If you do a little bit of research, you can get information from your medical records even though you don't have the actual medical records. So this is why I always tell patients that if you can't get a hold of your medical records, but you have a receipt for something that was done in that doctor's office or a receipt of the eSure or a Paragard or a Mirena IUD placement, and they're claiming that they never put the, the, the device in you uh, or uh, gave you that procedure, you can say, aha, medical board, they're claiming that they were, I was never their patient. Here is a receipt showing that I was, and then they're going to get on the doctors. The reason why it's, it's becoming so difficult is because a lot of patients think that they, they're, they're at a dead end, that they don't have an option available to them for their medical records. Um, and you do. Next, there are plenty of uh, times when a doctor will leave a practice. They will either go on and move to a different state or they will leave a group and try to go to a different group or go solo. Okay. The medical records, just like they are not owned by the patient, the medical records are not owned by the individual doctors. They're owned 
by the practice for which that doctor works. Now, it's possible that the doctor owns the practice, but technically the practice owns the medical records. So if that doctor were to sell his practice, the medical records are property of the practice and not property of the doctor. So those medical records have to be maintained under the same regulations and rules and regulations uh, for, um, for the individual doctors. Seven years for the state of Texas, 11 years for uh, hospitals in the state of Texas, that kind of arrangement is still, is still required. A doctor that retires or moves out of state must notify their medical boards of where they're going and where the medical records are related to the practice that they work for. So if you think, well, this, if you have any idea where a doctor went or, you're not, or you don't know where the doctor went, there is still national uh, data bank information as to did this doctor uh, set up shop in a different state. And if they set up shop in a different state, almost certainly they had to notify the new state of where they used to work and the, they're going to get a medical license in the new state based on anything that they did on the, on the previous license in a different state. So you can actually find your doctor where they went to, even if they're retired, they're supposed to keep uh, some information as to where the medical records are. So don't accept that the doctor went to a different practice. We don't even know where that doctor went to. Uh, don't accept that the doctor left this practice and we don't have those medical records. That is a false statement or a board a violation. If a doctor leaves a practice, that practice must hold on to the medical records of that doctor for the same period of time as if that doctor was still in the practice or with the practice. So keep that in mind when you're getting a dead end answer and be um, proactive and insisting that, listen, I know what the regulations are. And the easiest thing, and I know that it's all often said, don't do it, but Google it. Google uh, State Medical Board, get the information from your State Medical medical Board, ask them, call them, and ask them what the rules are. I've got a doctor that says that, uh, I've got a practice that says the doctor's not there anymore and I can't get a hold of my medical records. What should I do or what can I do? Okay, so that's the, the key related to that. So I think that I covered those particular points as far as the medical records are concerned. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about tonight is um, the, I know that you want to, many of you want to believe that we are doing our best to take care of you, and we are, we are, but there is enough of us out there that aren't, and that that you do have to be proactive for a majority of the things that you do, especially when it has to do with informed consent, especially when it has to do with a medical device that's going to be in your body for longer than a few days, for example. It, it includes breast implants, the uh, eShore uh, uh, device, Felshi clips. Uh, and I wanted to focus in on office because it's more likely that you're going to get an issue where medical records get, oof, they disappear. Now, obviously, you understand what can happen. If your medical records disappear, you can't sue. No, no practice, no attorney is going to take on your case if it's exceptionally hard to get a hold of medical records. There has to be some evidence that they can work with. And um, please answer when you can. Kathy, I'm sorry, there's so many comments coming up. Can you ask the question again? Hi, everybody. Hi. Quick uh, shout out. And because I had cut, um, I had promised that I was going to talk about um, OBGYN and deliveries. I want to extend a, a, a big um, applause to all of the nurse practitioners, nurse midwives that actually deliver uh, babies because the nurse midwives, nurse practitioners actually do a better job of taking care of their patients and laboring their patients than we do. Multiple stu studies have shown that on average, the nurse practitioners and midwives have an associated 5 to 10% chance of having a patient end up with a cesarean section or requiring a cesarean section, where in comparing the same type of patient to an OBGYN, the OBGYNs have a three times higher chance of winding up with a C-section. So where the nurse practitioners, nurse midwives have about a 10% chance of winding up with a C-section, the same type of person, same type of a patient, the uh, doctors are doing 30%. So 
C-section rates. Okay, here in El Paso, unfortunately, it's horrible. There are C-section rates higher than 50, 55 percent. And this is what a big shout out is to the nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, because we do know what's going on there. Just wanted to thank you again for post and PTO. Yes, um, thank you ladies for the post tubal ligation syndrome. This is very important for you as well, uh, especially with your records from the, from the hospital, because there are many different ways to do a tubal ligation and each one has potential issues on complications. Okay, this is, a, this is a problem with the, when you have had medical records that have gone more than 10 years, yes, it's very difficult to get those medical records unless the procedure was done at a hospital where the hospitals are required by regulations to hold on to them for 11 years or more. They still may be on micro um, uh, film and uh, that's very important. So I wish that I could have given this uh, speech a, a while back. Please, if it's been more than seven years, you're on a timeline. It's probably going to, you're probably not going to be able to get your medical records, but please go to your doctor's offices and get those medical records. And then you're going to have to be a little bit of a detective to go back and, and get them. Um, what other questions can I answer? Hi, everybody. Okay, I know that there's a lot of waving and watching, but I wish that I could have given you uh, different news on that. That, um, but the only, unfortunately, in the majority of cases, uh, you're going to have to penalize the doctor rather than get the information that you're looking for. But maybe, maybe you could be the person that makes that doctor think twice about not documenting properly or not um, um, keeping the medical records uh, for the patient. And again. Whenever you have a procedure done in the office, you should ask for a copy of your medical record of that particular procedure, and especially if there was an informed consent related to it. This is a minimum what you should do. Okay. Well, I have a lot of people who are watching, but not a lot of people that are asking questions. So I hope that I answered the question on why it's so important to get a hold of your medical records because it is a very convenient thing uh, is it true that they only have to hold? It is, uh, Amy, depending on your state, they may be required to only hold them less than 10 years. For example, here in the state of Texas, the, they only have to hold on to your medical records for seven years. So depending on what state you're in, it can be less than 10 years. And again, as I said before, I, I, it's not that we intentionally want to hide something, but uh, we, we just destroy them because it just requires so much time and effort to keep paper records. Now, now that we're, we're switching over to electronic medical records, many records are able, thousands or tens of thousands of records are able to be held onto uh, on disk and they may be held longer, but until the rules change, depending on your state, uh, they, they can, they are allowed to destroy them after a certain time period. Okay. You're welcome, Kathy, Amy. I hope that answered your question. And how is it legal to document tubal ligation when it now? Okay, a clarification, Amy, for example. You're absolutely right. Let's go back for a moment for the tubal ligation group. But it also applies to, to every other group. Tubal ligation is a generalized term that basically means destruction or closure of the fallopian tube. Tubal ligations should document the type of procedure that you're going to have done. If you want your tubes burned, it should say your tubes will be burned. If you want your tubes tied, it should say I want my tubes tied. Okay, tubal ligation is too broad a term and it, it should be very specific. Very specific. Felshi clips, Hulk clips, celastic bands, they are forms of tubal ligation, but they are unique and distinct and therefore you have a right to have that properly documented with informed consent related to the specific type of technique that's used. For example, tubal ligation by fulguration or burning of the fallopian tube is generally reversible but only to a certain point. If the entire tube is burned, you can't reverse that. 
A, a fallope uh, uh, silastic band is a silicone band placed on the fallopian tube. You can have a foreign body reaction to that, as you can with the Felschi clip or the Holka clip. All foreign bodies all can produce a, an array of autoimmune responses from your hair falling out to having memory lapses to excessive weight gain to very heavy periods to pain with intercourse uh, to, to, to bleeding all the time. Okay, uh, the eShore pro, uh, permanent sterilization device is a form of tubal ligation, but it is distinct because it is the only hysteroscopically inserted uh, form of tubal ligation, and therefore a tubal ligation informed consent is not, should is distinct as and should not be described as eShore uh, with tubal ligation. It should have its own form and documentation. Yes. Now here we go. There's a distinct form of, of ligation is different from um, cutting off a piece, such as if you cut off the end of the fallopian tube, that's called a fimbriectomy. It's called also named after the doctor that uh, that uh, came up with that is Kroner's technique. Okay, a fimbriectomy is a tubal ligation, but it's not the same as cauterization or burning of the fallopian tube. So it should document fimbriectomy in the in the in the um, informed consent. If you remove uh, the entire tube, that's called a salpingectomy, and that is not necessarily. It can be a, a very vague description of tubal ligation, but it is distinct enough that it should say salpingectomy rather than tubal ligation, and you should have informed consent related to salpingectomy. If an error or it's not properly documented, you have a right or to demand that it be corrected and that it be stated that it was a salpingectomy. The removal of the entire fallopian tube is different than simply cutting, burning, or putting a band or the, um, the Felschi clips or the Holka clips. Okay, the clips, the, folk, uh, the, the Felschi clips, the Holka clips, and even we want to talk to the Celastic bands. All of them are associated with a portion of it being titanium, but it's not absolutely pure titanium. So there's going to be some nickel components to it. There's going to be other um, um, uh, portions that are alloy, including chromium. Uh, Eshore, for example, has tin in it along with nickel, but it has tin. So if you have a foreign body reaction, you can become sensitized not only to that particular type of metal, but sensitized to other types of materials. And so it is possible to become sensitized or allergic to different things such as lavender and acrylic after you have uh, the foreign bodies inserted uh, in this group of uh, devices. So always very important when you sign for a cons uh, consent form for tubal ligation that you have it well documented as to how the procedure is going to be done and um, what are the risks, benefits, indications, and alternatives of that particular procedure as compared to another type of procedure. I hope that answers the tubal ligation question. Now, when you're talking about that, reversal is impossible when you have had a salpingectomy. It, reversal is impossible when you've had a, a fimbriectomy. So for those ladies that are looking to have a reversal of a tubal ligation because of post-tubal ligation syndrome, be aware that some types of um, tubal ligation are not reversible. I, you can, you can complain, uh, Amy. You can complain, and you can possibly sue on the grounds of lacking informed consent. There is a distinction between being able to sue and winning a case, and this is where the the attorneys get in and they say, you know what, this case isn't worth arguing about. If you um, if 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 we're not going to make any money simply because you got the tubal ligation done, it wasn't the type of tubal ligation that you wanted, but it was a type of tubal ligation that actually worked. Uh, and we understand that there's side effects to it, but all medical procedures have side effects. I think I sound like a broken record. I think you've heard it from many many doctors and probably a lot of attorneys, but. What you didn't get was proper informed consent. So yes, who could you complain to? You can complain to the medical boards. Doesn't mean you're, the medical board is not going to give you money. You're not going to win a lawsuit, but you can get some satisfaction in saying, 
this doctor did me wrong and he needs to understand or she needs to understand that she did wrong and not do it again to any other woman. Therefore, I'm going to make a complaint. And if that's your ultimate goal, then I think that you're going to succeed. But if you're looking to have uh, an attorney want to support your position, it's very hard to get an attorney to accept a case where um, the informed consent may have may not have been enough or proper, but damages are hard to come by or, or to, to explain and get um, a jury to, to award damages for. Uh, should I be tested to see if I'm allergic to nickel before having a shore removed? I've had hives on and off. Yeah, you can be tested, uh, 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 Jennifer. What I suggest that you get tested for is, and you get a, a cons consult with a rheumatologist and immunologist, you want to be tested for uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA, the rheumatoid factor, uh, TSH, or the thyroid stimulating hormone, the lupus panel, uh, the ROSSA and LASSB antibody screen for uh, uh, Sjogren's syndrome, uh, and if you're if you go to the allergist or you go to the rheumatologist and immunologist, you ask for a, a Melissa test, which is going to be distinct for nickel as well as uh, you can test for uh, titanium. It's okay to do a skin allergy test as well, but the sensitivity of both the Melissa test and the skin allergy test may not be a hundred percent. But recently in April. Uh, the FDA came out with some guidelines, recommendations related to the management of devices that have nickel and titanium in them, which is called uh, nictinol. That recommendation says that if the patient is showing autoimmune symptoms, autoimmune reactions to the device, that you should consider removing it. So on those grounds alone, I, I generally support my patients that are showing autoimmune symptoms to have the eShore device taken out without having a, either a Melissa test or uh, a skin allergy test done or any of the other tests. So this is important. It's keyly important that it should be multidisciplinary because your gynecologist, I can bet a thousand dollars, probably has never even heard of a Melissa test before. So uh, that, that's very important why you should uh, uh, become your own advocate. Go Google this, FDA draft recommendations for nictinol. N-I-T-I-N-O-L. It came out in April of this year. And with hand, with in your hand, go to your rheumatologist, immunologist, and then back to the gynecologist and say, I need these devices out. It's very important for me. Uh, to include warning, risk of tubal ligation does have side effects and they refuse to tell women about it. Of course, this is, um, I've been doing tubal ligations for more than 20 years. I've, re I've done more than 2,000. If you can ask any of my patients that come in, and I, the first thing that I tell them, are you absolutely positively sure that you want to get your tubes tied? And of course, I always hear that, well, I've had three children, I don't want to have any more kids. I said, imagine for a moment that situations were, were completely changed and you were by yourself. Would you, would you ever think about having another baby if you were by yourself? If you And they said, yes, I would still, want to have another baby. I said, okay, let's try something different. Okay, but if they answer no, I still don't want to have any more kids, then the next comment is going to be the your husband, boyfriend, or significant other should get a vasectomy because the vasectomy has lower risk, lower side effects, and the guy needs to step up to the plate and do what's right by you because you had all the babies, you delivered the babies, you're taking care of the babies. He should get the vasectomy. Okay, it doesn't change your manhood. It doesn't uh, make you... Uh, uh, less of a man in bed or anything like that. Yes, there's a very small percentage of men that have some, some discomfort related to the vasectomy for a short period of time. When I had mine, uh, I, I was in pain for a few weeks, uh, actually for a few months, but then I got better. But I, I can tell you from experience, I had my vasectomy done. I was awake when I had it done. I, had it, uh, um, uh, I was back in the office. Uh, three hours later, when I had it reversed, I needed a few days off to recover from that. So I always tell patients, uh, vasectomy, 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 vasectomy. Okay, or you're going to get cold showers. Just tell them, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to have another baby, so it, you're going to take cold showers until you get a vasectomy. That's what I recommend. Next, and this is an explanation 
it, it's not an excuse, but it's, a, it's, it's an explanation. Doctors are not going to try to convince you not to have a, a, a tubal ligation. They're going to tell you that it's very safe, very effective, and generally that it is, okay? But we're looking at between 2 and 5% of women that are going to have significant side effects to a tubal ligation, and those women are going to have problems with cognitive changes, emotional changes, uh, abnormal periods, excessive weight gain, and if they have had a foreign body attached to that, such as a, a, a celastic band or the Fels eclipse, the Hulk eclipse, they're going to have the same type of autoimmune reactions that patients with Eshore have. And so the reason why um, this message is not getting out is because the vast majority of doctors don't believe in the post tubal ligation syndrome. So if you don't believe in something, you're not going to be talking about it. And if you have a financial incentive not to talk about it, you're not going to be talking about it. And so until uh, ACOG, for example, uh, supports post tubal ligation syndrome, or until the integrity of the field of obstetrics and gynecology, which mind you, I think that the field, my specialty of obstetrics and gynecology happens to be one of the most corrupt, unprofessional, unethical uh, specialties of all of the medical specialties. Here's a specialty where 50% of women are getting unnecessary cesarean sections, unnecessary surgeries, and yet they listen to their patients say, thank you, thank you, thank you for saving my baby. And they in their back of their minds know that they just wanted to go home or they had to go on vacation or it was going to be the weekend and they just wanted a c-section of the patient so here they're getting this gratitude from their patient and in the back of their mind they're saying she had no idea that i just sectioned her because i just wanted to go home that is horribly unprofessional and yet that is the vast majority of what's going on in obstetrics that's why eshore permanent sterilization device was so popular because of the uh, the financial benefits the doctors were getting from it that's why felsch eclipse hulk eclipse celastic bands improper placement of the iud's uh learning curve issues with the da vinci uh robot uh, improper placement or inappropriate placement or just incompetent placement of meshes. The mesh, the abdominal meshes, vaginal meshes, uh, um, the uh, urethral meshes, and the sacrococcal pexy me meshes. These are harming women every single day and yet thousands of women, tens of thousands of women, and yet those devices are still on the market. So I can appreciate what your position is why can't doctors tell me about post-tubal ligation syndrome? The entire specialty is corrupted. It's com completely corrupted. So this is the issues that we have to deal with and what we're looking at and why women are still suffering and, and being taken advantage of. And this is one of the reasons why I do these presentations. I encourage all of you to go and research all of this. I'm not telling you anything that I'm not going to stand behind that hasn't already been talked about hundreds of thousands of times, uh, if not by the doctors themselves, but by the experiences of the women that are suffering. So this is why I encourage all of you to share these videos because prove me wrong. Prove that anything that I've said is wrong, that we don't have a 50% C-section rate that's, un that's not necessary, that women were guinea pigs for the da Vinci robot until they, uh, doctors finally started to, um, to learn how to use it, and that still doctors that are subpar on the, ro on the robot are still using the robot to keep up their skills, and they're using the robot for tubal ligations. Ridiculous, okay? Vaginal meshes. The, ure the, the urogynecologists are still placing vaginal meshes when they know the potential side effects of them. And they're harming women because you can't get these meshes out of the body. Okay? This is what I'm talking about. It's, it's a terrible uh, situation. Terrible thing that's going on in my specialty. And I wish we could um, change that all. And it, it basically, you have to push back. You... I keep telling patients you have to be smarter and better than the doctors are and maybe when the doctors stop making money they'll finally start changing their ways. Uh, this, is, this is the only thing that I can tell you because I've been doing this for 20 years and it hasn't changed in 20 years. It just from 20 years ago it was, it was just the c-section issue. 
Then came um, the issues with the Scholastic Bands and the Felshi Eclipse and the Hulk Eclipse. Then came the issues with uh, the meshes, abdominal meshes, vaginal meshes, urethral meshes, and so-called pexy meshes. Then the thing uh, came with Eshore, a permanent sterilization device. Then the thing came with um, um, uh, the, then we finally started to see the, the, the changes with the autoimmune conditions that are associated with all of these. And finally, the Da Vinci, the Da Vinci learning curve, uh, where the thing that I have, there's nothing wrong with using the Da Vinci. It's just that most doctors that, need, that use the Da Vinci are placing five or six port sites that are this long, okay, this long, when it should be less than a fingertip, going in through the belly button and a couple to, to, to do most of the procedures, okay? The worst pain that you're gonna feel with Da Vinci is gonna be on the left or right hand side just below the rib cage. These hurt a lot for weeks, and they don't have to hurt if you just did a traditional laparoscopic. Then all of a sudden, all of these masters of Da Vinci decided, I'm gonna use a single port. I'm just gonna use one port right in the belly button. They don't tell you that they stretch out your belly button uh, like it, you had delivered a baby, okay? So for those ladies that love the appearance of their belly button, there, there's a high probability that you're gonna develop a hernia there or that it's gonna be permanently distorted that you're not gonna to wanna to wear uh, anything that shows off your belly button anymore. These are the things that are not told, uh, that you're not told. So this is the key issues with informed consent and why I'm glad to answer the questions as honestly as I can. But here I go off on a tangent as usual, so. Nevertheless, are there any more questions related to in, um, medical records for tonight? Okay, so please share these. I'm gonna post them again on, on uh, my Facebook page as well as drnavoa.com. And if you're not aware, uh, the, the ones that I've been recently posting with Danielle, we, are, we have posted them to YouTube, okay? They are Dr. Navoa and Danielle. If you go to YouTube and type in Dr. Navoa and Danielle, you will see the Friday presentations that we've been doing and you will be able to see uh, this one I will post later on tonight or tomorrow. I really, really encourage you to go ahead and, um, and share this with everyone. For the international patients, please be sure to share them uh, internationally. Uh, para ellas que, que hablan español, perdón que Español no es mi primer idioma, so me hace difícil hablar, pero voy a tratar de hacer una presentación en español para ustedes. Sorry, I don't speak Portuguese or Italian, uh, but um, hopefully that uh, uh, Google will come up with a, tra um, a verbal translator and we'll be able to share this with everyone. So feel free to um, send me any messages through drnavoa.com and any questions that we may be able to do in another presentation. And I really appreciate you taking the time to watch the videos. We get anywhere between 4,000 and 5,000 views. We are here to help you. We are here to give you the God's honest truth. There's not sugarcoating that's gonna happen. And that's what we're, we're talking about. So the only way that you're gonna help yourself and you're gonna help your f fellow sisters that, that are suffering from uh, medical malfeasance, malpractice, is to share the messages that we're, sh we're sharing with you so that we better educate ourselves. And that's the key and that's what, why I do what I do. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for watching and hope to see you next week. Thank you so much. Good night.